morning all and welcome to this uh, second uh, uh, learning portfolio showcase. Uh, I was uh, just remarking to Laura uh, as we were getting going that uh, uh, it's actually been so gratifying to see the, the increasing numbers of people engaged with the, the learning portfolio over the last couple of years and with the increasing refinement of it as a tool for, uh, for uh, student growth and development and uh, it'll be great today again to turn our attention to the learning portfolio and to give some thought to ways in which we can begin to draw out even more of its potential for the benefit of our students. It is after all just a tool like all the other things, Bristol board and all the other stuff that have been used in the classroom, but I think what's remarkable, uh, remarkable about the, uh, the e-portfolio as a tool is that it in a way is a tool of the student and it is through the use of that that the student in fact can, can uh, can play a very active role in shaping an individual course uh, for their own development uh, and uh, assemble a total picture of themselves as a, not only as a student, but as, a, as an individual aiming to, to take up uh, work and uh, some of the demands of life beyond the university. The portfolio is that kind of inclusive and comprehensive tool. So, uh, students are the true stars of the showcase and uh, I know you've all been having a look at uh, uh, the, the different student portfolios around the room uh, before we got going. So we've made uh, great progress. Uh, the numbers are stale but uh, at the moment we have 23 different courses using learning portfolios with 5,400 student users and almost 17,000 unique pieces of content created for those portfolios. And I think that's uh, a remarkable sign of progress and not progress in the integration of the portfolio uh, in the learning life of the university. Um, this year we've worked to enhance the learning portfolio program not just through expanding it, increasing those numbers, uh, but through strategic evaluation and enrichment of the program. And METL, the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning, launched this year uh, a Learning Portfolio Fellows program. Uh, the seven fellows, all faculty members, uh, are actively pursuing research uh, designed to measure the impact of the portfolios and to use that information to guide refinements of the tool uh, itself and uh, uh, refinement in the ways in which we use it. So you'll hear more about that from Arshad Ahmad, director of METL, uh, shortly. So to provide a glimpse of how we might take those steps forward, moving uh, the learning portfolio here at, at McMaster from its infancy through its adolescence and into its adulthood, um, we have invited Dr. Helen Chen to provide our keynote address today. Uh, Dr. Chen is the director of ePortfolio Initiatives in the office of the University Registrar, and she's a research scientist in the Designing Education Lab in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, a graduate of UCLA with a PhD in communications from Stanford, Helen has become a leader in innovative pedagogy uh, and in learning assessment. She's collaborated with the Association of American Colleges and Universities on a variety of assessment related initiatives. She's the co-director for research uh, for the Association for Authentic, Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning and she serves on the editorial board for the International Journal of ePortfolio. Uh, Helen and her colleagues uh, John Nittleson and Tracy Penny Light, uh, the latter of whom was a visiting scholar here very recently, uh, are the co-authors of a book on documenting learning with ePortfolios. Helen's current research interests involve engineering and entrepreneurship education, assessing the role of learning spaces and e-portfolios in supporting innovations and reflective practice in teaching and learning, and reimagining the traditional academic transcript to incorporate other evidence of students' skills, uh, knowledge, and capacities, including both their curricula and their co-curricular activities. So Helen's talk today is why e-portfolios, why now, documenting learning in the 21st century. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Helen Chen. Yeah. 
So good morning. I'm really delighted to be here. It's really such a pleasure to be able to come and visit uh, McMaster and really was just so thrilled to have the opportunity to interact with your students. You have some amazing students and to be able to ask them and talk to them about their portfolios was really very exciting for me. So. Um, you know, when I first started to explore ePortfolios in 1998, um, I was the project director of the Learning Careers Project. Um, it was a research study that was funded by the uh, Hewlett Foundation, and basically I followed 30 Stanford undergraduates from their freshman year until graduation, looking at their experiences inside and outside the classroom that comprised their education at Stanford. You know, certainly at that time, and certainly not now, the concept of ePortfolios is not a new one. Um, but in those late 1990s, early 2000s, there was an interest from communities such as the predecessor to the Educause Learning Initiative that was really focused primarily on building ePortfolio tools. Now, if you asked me then if I thought ePortfolios would still be around 15 or some odd years later, I might have said no. I mean, is it just another educational or technology fad and so on? But what's been surprising is that there is something about this concept or this paradigm of portfolios that continues to resonate not only across higher education, but also in K-12 education and in a variety of fields. So in preparing for this talk, even though I titled it, Why ePortfolios, Why Now? The questions I would like to explore with you are less so on the technology of ePortfolios specifically, but more on, this, on its relevance to learning in the 21st century. So in thinking about what is learning in the 21st century, now, obviously, we're embarking on a changing educational landscape, you know, with online education, flipped classes, MOOCs, hybrid and blended learning, certainly increasing concerns about the cost of higher education, and as always, employability and job placement after graduation. You know, increasingly, we are in the position of having to question, like, what is the added value of a college education? What is the impact? And then how do we show and demonstrate and communicate this kind of impact, the changes that we're making to a variety of stakeholders, from parents, students themselves, policymakers, as well as employers? But perhaps more importantly than you know, what is learning in the 21st uh, century is this question about what is it like to be a learner in the 21st century. And I guess you know, this, this, you know, as we face these questions about um, you know, demonstrating impact, this question about how we, do we define what a degree really means. You know, is it just a collection of courses? Is it a collection of credits or units and so on? And what does that degree, what does that transcript really say about actual student learning, actual learning that a student can take that with them and share that with graduate schools, with other institutions, with employers, with their families. So again, this question, what is learning in the 21st, what is it like to be a learner in the 21st century? Who are our students and what role does technology play in their lives? Now, this graphic that came from the Gates Foundation really highlights, I think, the diversity that of our students. You know, that majority of them are, you know, part-time students, that they are, you know, raising children, they are financially independent. If anything, what this graphic here represents is are the multiple pathways that students are achieving their higher education degree these days. That it's not one size fits all. And I'm going to come back to this idea of multiple pathways. Now, before I go forward uh, further and talk about why ePortfolios, and I'd like to start with just some sort of basic definitional uh, kinds of aspects. Uh, when I talk about a portfolio, I talk about a purposeful selection of artifacts that together with ref reflections represent some aspect of the owner's learning. In this case, we're talking mainly about students as the owner of those portfolios, but certainly portfolios have been used in other contexts as well, particularly for faculty, for uh, promotion and tenure, programs or schools or faculties for, um, you know, for accreditation or credentialing purposes, and so on, institutions as well. Now, those artifacts, of course, could be any representation or pieces of evidence that, you know, that would communicate some aspect of of the kind of learning that is happening. But it's really the reflections that pull everything together. Now at Stanford, we really focus on building not just sort of the portfolios themselves, but really how to create a culture, a culture of what we call folio thinking, of providing students with structured opportunities to not only create those learning portfolios, but also reflect on those learning experiences, and really to make those connections among the experiences that they have inside and outside the classroom, on campus and, and off campus as well. And hopefully, you know, as they go on after they leave our institutions and go on for the rest of their lives. 
Now, in terms of the different kinds of purposes of portfolios, um, these I think will be familiar to you with respect to the showcase, the assessment, uh, learning portfolios, or some sort of combination or hybrid versions of the, of the above. Now, increasingly, I'd like to just sort of differentiate between the showcase portfolios versus the assessment portfolios. As I go on to talk about portfolios to faculty on my campus as well as other institutions, most of the times we're thinking about the showcase portfolios, um, you know, which is what, what you think about when most often when you think about the traditions of portfolios in teacher education, art, and architecture, and so on. That it's a curated collection highlighting exemplary work you know, that's been formal or perhaps verified. The focus really being on the ePortfolio product and the goals being sort of outward facing, you know, networking your professional identity. Many students often ask, well, you know, couldn't I do the portfolios, you know, in LinkedIn? And LinkedIn could certainly be seen as one kind of portfolio, one kind of showcase portfolio. Uh, they have also started to provide additional features that allow including links or documents, writing samples, and so on. The audience for the showcase portfolio really is the public, you know, it's grad schools, uh, employers professionals and so on. Now the other kind of portfolio, and I think this is really the opportunity for institutions such as ours, is really the learning portfolio that where you can, where it is sort of primarily exploratory, developmental over time, where one could include personal goals, um, works in progress, other kinds of plans. The focus really on that portfolio process, the folio thinking process, and with the goal being to help students not only develop their, not necessarily develop their professional identity, but their intellectual identity, their identity as a learner. So again, that self-knowledge and understanding the growth over time. And then of course, where we get, where the opportunity is particularly, you know, within the institution is to be able to be selective about who you choose to share that portfolio with. That, you know, that this is a safe space, that you know, when I put something up, I don't have to worry about it following me on Google for the rest of my life. That, you know, that I can select you know, this idea of you know, mentors, advisors, faculty, whoever it might be, both for undergraduate as well as for graduate students. And you know, that sort of selective permissions then really opens up the possibility to talk about failure, to explore areas around resilience and things along those lines. So I I think um, one thing I know that our academic advising um, group is exploring with is this idea of can you build a personal advisory board? You know that where you know some sort of board that you're going to that help coach you along as you move along uh, your educational trajectory. So how I'd like to frame my talk today is actually around four themes. Um, the first, just very briefly, being connections. You know, how can learning portfolios help students make those connections among the different experiences that they have? The second being uh, community as well as culture, as we think about who are the stakeholders for these learning portfolios that we're asking students to, to create. You know, is it going to be the case where if we build it, they will, will they come? You know, kind of thing. Or how do we create this culture that's receptive to this idea of portfolios and open to exploring those? ideas. The third is actually capturing, uh, capturing and documentation. I'm going to speak a little bit about my work in the registrar's office around developing new kinds of records to really document the 21st century that uh, learning that is happening. And the last is actually uh, a little bit um, of work that we're doing around sort of creativity. This opportunity to think of yourselves as you know innovators, innovators in this space. And we certainly need that kind of innovation um, in this kind of work. And how do we empower you and support you as innovators in designing these kinds of new experiences you know, for students. So first, with respect to connections, really thinking about the role of learning portfolios and supporting this greater synthesis and integration across various learning experiences. Now, some of my work with the Association of American Colleges and Universities takes a pass at sort of defining a liberal education around these kinds of outcomes, which I think are familiar to most people around, you know, integrative learning, personal and social responsibility, critical thinking, teamwork, um, leadership, and so on. Now, um, in my work in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, I work with a faculty member, uh, Professor Sherry Shepard, um, on several of her en engineering education projects. And, and um, in the States, of course, we have ABET as our accrediting body. And you know, our Department of Mechanical Engineering sort of has a list of these outcomes that they state on, the, on their website that you know, all mechanical engineering undergraduates should graduate with these kinds of skills. And again, they, they're not unfamiliar. The one I've highlighted 
highlighted here is an ability to function on multidisciplinary teams. Now, we had an undergraduate student, Michelle Grau, who took these outcomes and decided, okay, well, I'm gonna think about my undergraduate experience and where did I develop those skills? You know, where did I develop the skills around teamwork? And what she put together was very interesting. I'm gonna show you a few excerpts. So again, multidisciplinary teams, and what did she choose to highlight? First, she chose to highlight her high school experiences, you know, uh, working um, as, you know, as part of a member of the first robotics team. And that was something she did in high school, but something she continued to do after coming to Stanford, um, you know, coaching some of the local high school teams in the area. The second was actually her involvement in a first year seminar, an introductory seminar where she uh, worked with students from the humanities and sciences, other students from different majors. She was a member of the uh, Professor Shepard's lab, the designing education lab for two years, worked on several of our NSF studies, looking at uh, surveying um, undergraduate students, trying to be, you know, find out what kinds of factors influence whether or not they choose to major in engineering or not. And then lastly, she included this video of her uh, doing a form in the Stanford Blue Shoe Club. And I choose to highlight these because it really represents the holistic view of her education, you know, her experiences, where she thought she developed the skills of teamwork. You know, as, let's say, an individual faculty member or a staff member, I don't know that she's doing all these things and so on. Not all these things are showing up on their transcript. Maybe the only things that show up are the introductory seminar and mention of summer undergraduate research and so on. But, you know, the other things do not. And, you know, the idea is, you know, and this, maybe this is a highlight for what I'm going to talk more about later is that um, our register happens to really feel strongly that the transcript as that official record of you know an education at Stanford or, Mc, or McMaster should represent what we value as an institution you guys are doing some amazing things some really in innovative work around teaching and learning innovations in pedagogy uh, technology and so on but those things don't show up on the transcript and how can we transform that what I think we maybe we need a new kind of record or multiple records to be able to really articulate and, and make visible, demonstrate, you know, what we are bringing to students and especially in light of, you know, again, this changing higher, higher ed landscape. The other program I want to talk briefly about is this notation and science communication. I had the opportunity to talk with one of the students uh, who took the science communication course. And, um, this particular uh, course was designed in our program in writing and rhetoric. It was designed for uh, science majors who were, um, you know, who were interested in developing science communication skills and so on. Now, in designing this course, they did not want to make it just, okay, you're going to take five extra classes and then you're going to get this notation, this certificate that will show up on your transcript. They really wanted um, to, um, actually incorporate the portfolio as, a, as sort of the means by which a student would earn that notation or not. So yes, they would take some classes, they would have a portfolio course and so on, um, and they accepted 20 students into the initial cohort, but they acknowledge actually that not all 20 students will actually get this notation on the, on the transcript. What actually will get them the actual notation is the portfolio that they submit, you know, that will be evaluated by kind of a, a board, you know, some, you know, faculty, perhaps alumni, other um, you know, people that they could engage on some sort of criteria. So of course at the information session you had that inevitable question from a student who says, well what's the minimum number of things that I need to put into this portfolio in order to get the notation? Well the answer to that is whatever it takes, okay, because you have these criteria for this, what does it mean to have competency in science communication, okay, and then what kind of evidence do you need to bring forward to demonstrate that you've achieved that level of competency, okay, so it's not a checklist, it's, and you know, and that, you know, that portfolio is, you know, evaluated by an external sort of, you know, board of, you know, ad, you know, evaluation board and so on. And then the, our hope is that, you know, the students that earn this notation, okay, so first of all, the students that don't earn the notation, at least they have a portfolio. They have something that they could still take with them, take excerpts out, you know, to show employers of writing samples or podcasts and so on. But the students that do have the portfolio, we're, 
partnering with our library because we have a Stanford digital repository in our library that a snapshot of that portfolio that as it was completed, as it was um, the portfolio that earned them that notation would then go into the Stanford digital repository. A permanent URL would be generated and then it could be linked to from our electronic transcript. We currently do this with our uh, PhD theses that you know we have PDFs of all our um, PhD theses and so on, sometimes honors theses as well, and then we have this permanent URL, and then on our electronic transcript, you know, that the student could then, you know, that they could be clicked to and go to the PhD, uh, the, the thesis. But we're envisioning something similar with the, um, with the portfolio, that, you know, that again, you take that transcript, the electronic transcript, and actually be able to link to evidence, the evidence that earned that uh, notation. So again, as we think about, again, the different kinds of elements that, that go into the notation, the different, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, reflections or problem sets or, you know, podcasts or posters and so on, you know, those are the kinds of things that are coming up in the, um, in the portfolios themselves, um, using a way to kind of visualize not only sort of the artifact and the piece of evidence, as well as the, uh, the reflection on the side. So those are just a few examples. Okay, so moving on to community, um, this idea of how do we create a culture of folio thinking and practice, um, a culture that is re receptive to the ideas around portfolios, and really starting, you know, what we think is with this um, the academic trajectory of students. Now, this you may have uh, seen before. You know, Tracy and I collaborated closely on this, but this is one of my go-to slides whenever I talk to um, institutions and faculty and staff about portfolios. Is that to really take the time to envision what is that educational trajectory of your students as they move through the institution? To really start there, because it should always start you know with your students your campus culture you know at Stanford you know they start all the students come in as freshmen you know they they're channeled through our vice provost for undergraduate education with they have a pre-major advisor they take um, perhaps their general education courses introductory seminars eventually towards sophomore junior year they're declaring their major they're moving into sort of the department the purview of the department they take their major courses maybe they choose to study abroad or engage in undergraduate research and then maybe do some sort of capstone or honors thesis. Now the things that you see in those white boxes are typically the kinds of the academic side of things, the academic courses, and are captured on the transcript. But you know, as we've been thinking about an institutional plan for implementing portfolios, one thing we did not want to do was yet add yet another layer on top of what people are already doing. And as we think about the value of reflection, you know, we really want to identify those milestones within this undergraduate learning career where students are already reflecting. And and how can we use the portfolio to leverage and to help capture and document those things that they're already doing and then also faculty are already doing. So, you know, for example, you know, when students are thinking about what they want to major in, you know, when they think about what, what do I want to do this summer? Am I going to pursue a summer job or internship? Am I, um, you know, what do I uh, want to, uh, you know, what do I want to do when I, uh, you know, do my honors thesis, you know, study abroad and so on, and really just try to identify those milestones. Now, Along the way, though, are also you know, who you interact with along the way in terms of who are the people that are supporting them in these efforts. And that's how we went about to identify who our stakeholders were, you know, who are the people that we needed to partner with. So again, as you're thinking about, you know, perhaps the educational trajectory, you know, here at McMaster, things that you might consider, what, you know, what are those milestones? You know, when and where are students uh, reflecting? Who are they interacting with? And what faculty, staff, offices, programs, and services are being engaged? So with that, you have a handout in front of you. And you know, what I'd like you to do is just maybe take about you know, a minute or so, and you can do this you know, in pairs or, you know, or individually, and so on, to think about like, if you have this student portfolio, you know, and you, know, you do have student portfolios, you know, who would be interested in looking at that, those portfolios? You know, who, who would be those stakeholders? Who would you want to engage? So if you could just take a minute, and again, you can do it in um, pairs if you like, and just maybe just do a little bit of sketching there. What did people come up with? What are some examples of, um, of uh, people, you know, stakeholders? Other students. Other students, okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, okay. Community members, okay. Yeah. Grad schools. 
Investors, okay, so if we're thinking kind of entrepreneurially, you know, the opportunities there, yes. Self. Yourself, okay, yes, yes. Okay, yes in the back. Mentors and mentees, especially, you know, I heard a little bit about peer mentoring programs this morning. Yes, in the back. Uh, career counselors for advisors. Yes, career counselors, advisors. Accrediting bodies. Accrediting bodies, right, right, yes. Leaders? Leaders? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I think this idea of like thinking about who the different stakeholders are can really influence um, you know, how portfolios are designed, what goes into a portfolio. You know, increasingly, I think, thinking about different portfolios for different purposes. You know, we sort of talked a little bit about that, about that earlier. You know, the idea of perhaps a learning portfolio that is supported by the institution as students are moving through the institution, but that, you know, could then pieces, you know, from that learning portfolio be used for showcase purposes for these different kinds of audiences that you've identified. Now, you know, when this I need to actually update, and I, we did this, you know, um, you know, this is sort of maybe a little bit dated now in terms of, you know, our thinking to include some of the additional sort of stakeholders that have been mentioned. But yes, first and foremost, that we feel that this portfolio really should be for the student, you know, that they really need to own it. That ideally, that they would, you know, take the experience that they've had and then be able to continue adding to it after the course is over. And that I think also has some technology implications for this idea of having a portfolio that is not constrained just to individual course, but the idea perhaps of building a program portfolio across, let's say, a particular, you know, major or department or faculty, whatever it might be. You know, talking with one student who was an um, engineering first year student, he talked at length about this project that he um, developed the different prototypes, included the prototypes and the sketches and so on. And I said to him, wow, I would love to see your portfolio in four years. You know, I mean, this is just the beginning. I mean, what kinds of things are you going to be able to continue to add to that portfolio so that at the end of four years you're going to have a whole series of projects. But again, not just, you know, here's project one, project two, project three, project four, but, you know, what are you, um, you know, what are you taking, you know, what are those skills and, and, you know, that you're developing as part of these projects? Like if someone asks you about teamwork skills, then can you, can you tell me, you know, you know give me those examples? Because I think a lot of it is, um, and I see this with our students as well, I mean, they take these portfolios and they'll walk you right through it, right? They'll give you the page one, page two, walk through through all the pages. Well, that's great, but now I want you to flip it. You know, if I ask you about leadership, what kinds of experiences would you draw out? You know, I mean, sure, you talked about leadership in the context of your leadership development, class or you know or your you know, your Mac week and so on but you know now I want, it was interesting because I think one uh, one young woman that I spoke with about the Mac week was fascinating because you know she kind of watches through her entire portfolio but I said then what are your three takeaways like if you were gonna you know I'm an employer I'm looking at your resume I see that it says Mac week well I don't know what that is so what did you get out of that experience and so on and then she said oh teamwork leadership development um, you know this opportunity to kind of gain some knowledge about going out into the community. And I thought that was fascinating. And I think that's exactly, you know, make it, it seems like there's still a gap between, you know, yes, I had this experience and I can tell you what I did, but what did I actually learn? And sometimes putting that, what did I actually learn in the context, you're talking to your parents, you're talking to your advisor, you're talking to an employer, you know, to help them have that audience in mind and then they're tailoring the message accordingly. So uh, certainly students, you know, where, again, I'll talk a little bit more about my work with the registrar's office in terms of new kinds of records. We're certainly working very closely with our academic advisors. Um, again, this concept of having, let's say, a personal advisory board, you know, someone that would, you know, that you would use the portfolio as a way to facilitate conversation and get feedback from. You know, uh, certainly lots of interest from uh, career development, career services. We're seeing them as a very important partner in this effort. And then also some of our colleagues in student affairs, you know, student life, who are taking this more holistic view. I and mean, that is part of their, the work that they do is a more holistic view about who the student is, you know, from, you know, student uh, mental health, their personal wellness, resiliency, are all issues that they're interested in. And then, of course, working more closely with faculty and instructors, you know, really how do we embed portfolios as a tool within the teaching and learning and the pedagogy activities you know, within the university? 
Um, another group that, again, I'll talk a little bit more about shortly is the opportunity to engage alumni. You know, we know that there's no group that is more invested in sort of in the current and future success of our institutions than alumni, and they are certainly an untapped resource. And I think there's a unique opportunity with ePortfolios because they are electronic and they are digital to perhaps engage alumni who are not, you know, physically close, who do not live geographically close to campus, and that's something that we've been experimenting with as well. Um, the other areas that we're certainly very interested in, you know, through our career services, you know, engaging with employers, um, you know, the role of portfolios potentially in admissions, and then um, also our study abroad as another sort of experiential learning ex uh, thing that, you know, we might be trying to leverage. You know, the way that these portfolios can inform, um, you know, institutional research as well as assessment, particularly around program evaluation. Again, the few Mac Week uh, portfolios that I saw, I thought, well, this is your data set right there. You know, I mean, you know, forget having to try to administer another survey or, you know, do focus groups. I mean, it's actually all embedded in, this, in the portfolios themselves. I mean, you could just sort of mine that portfolio for evaluation information about what we do, you know, what's the benefit and the value of the MAC week and how we can use that information to improve it the next time around. And then also looking at other institutions as well. Um, some of my colleagues that work in the California State University system as well as the community college system are looking at the role of portfolios in facilitating transfer from two-year to four-year institutions. So I want to go in a little bit uh, more deeply about, you know, these different kinds of stakeholders and also, um, you know, a, how to frame port learning portfolios in a way that really meets the needs of uh, individual stakeholders. So obviously, if I'm talking with students, I'm not going to be giving the same talk that I'm giving to you right now. Um, I would actually frame portfolios in a different way. So um, this is part of a presentation I gave to our Native American Cultural Center and really kind of framed it around what are you getting out of your Stanford education? Now, this was actually happened just after our fall job fair, and so students had fresh in their mind, you know, the kinds of skills that, you know, employers <coughs> We're asking about you know communication skills teamwork and so on but then within the native center there's also a strong interest in kind of personal values and attributes around wellness um, you know discipline flexibility integrity and so on so where would students typically develop these you know skills most often through experiences and those experiences can be formal academic experiences such as courses but they could also be part of their involvement in clubs and organizations doing outreach other kinds of projects we have a, a, a Stanford powwow every year that is organized by students and so on those kinds of experiences now, typically, you know, it stops right there. You know, when you think about your resume, your transcript, you know, skills, and then the, here are the experiences and so on. What we're aspiring to with the learning portfolio is to provide them with, you know, is that to make that connection to evidence. And I think the word evidence really is becoming, um, you know, you know, it has, it has been something that's really come into the foreground as something that's important. That it's not enough to say, I have these skills. It's not enough to say that, you know, that I'm a leader or I took calculus and so on, but I really want to see evidence of that. So that's most obvious with something like, let's say, leadership. You know, it's not like you take a class in leadership, you get an A, and that means you have leadership skills kind of thing. And even with these great students who, you know, develop those leadership development portfolios, clearly that's just the beginning. And how do they take the skills that they develop around, you know, this process or thinking about the different areas around time management and so on, and how do they apply that process to now other parts of their lives? So evidence, obviously, in the form of writing samples, multimedia, other kinds of promotional materials and, and so on. But again, not just evidence in and of itself, but connected to, you know, to um, their learning. You know, that, and really where this comes to then is around storytelling. How do I tell the story of my education, my experience, and how it fits together? So it's not like you have skills on one side, evidence on the other, but how do you make that connection? Now, um, another project that we're working on um, these days is actually around graduate students and helping graduate students, master's students, PhD students, as well as postdocs develop learning portfolios. Actually, most of them are probably interested in the showcase portfolios because the reality is for many of our PhDs is that they are not going into academic positions, that they are really thinking about alternative, pow alternative pathways. Many of them have prior experiences that they're trying to figure out how do I bring this in, and so trying to make those 
those connections and to be able to tell an effective and persuasive story about their education. Um, this curriculum is online. This actually comes from Professor Lisa McNair, who's uh, a professor of engineering education at Virginia Tech University. We've taken her curriculum and iterated on it. And actually, the pilot that we're running right now with about 30 uh, grad students is around portfolio to professional because we wanted to include um, you know, masters as well as uh, master students as well. What's exciting about this particular pilot, and this really again speaks to sort of the partnerships that one can engage in, is that this particular pilot is you know led by you know myself and the registrar's office together with our career services and career services not only on main campus, you know, for undergraduate students, but also in education, school of medicine, um, as well as our vice provost for graduate education. So it really is a collaborative effort. One thing I really appreciate about my colleague. In in, um, in career services, Dr. Sheetal Patel. She's actually the director of branding for our career services. And she really takes that sort of angle of, you know, thinking about um, the branding, advertising, and marketing sort of approach to helping students think about their online presence and their digital, their online identity and so on. And has taken some techniques that have been very effective in terms of how to get students to tell their story, you know, in two to three sentences. And to use that as sort of the front page of their portfolio and then you think about it, that's almost like your thesis. It's your thesis and then everything, what, everything else in the portfolio is there to sort of back that up. If you say that I'm a creative thinker, well, what does that mean and what does that look like? So much with the portfolios that we're helping these students develop are really focused on showing, not telling. That it's not that you just take your CV and your publications and you copy and paste that into a web page. You know, it's like how do you highlight you know, some of your research with either a quotation or, you know, or an image and so on. So it's interesting it's really brought up conversations around um, you know instructional design you know graphic design and so on as part of that but students want that they want something that is professional looking and I think increasingly you know as a society you know because we're used to seeing you know these professionally designed websites that you know that's what we want to see too and so how do we help students sort of create that representation of themselves the other group I want to talk about as really I do see as an untapped resource are actually alumni and we had a pilot with our Stanford Alumni Association, um, two pilots actually. One was actually engaging, we had undergraduate students create these portfolios and we actually engaged a group of alumni who were in the Bay Area to look at these portfolios and then meet with the students face to face over dinner. And, you know, that was fantastic and it was really great to see that interaction and students really being amazed that alumni actually looked at their portfolios and, um, and you know, some of the things that we might say to our students over and over again, the fact that it's coming from an alum, you know, somehow is much more persuasive and effective. So, you know, reiterating that kind of message. But the second pilot um, that we did was actually a group of students at Stanford creating portfolios, but then alum, a group of alumni in Washington, D.C. And, you know, trying to leverage the idea that these are electronic portfolios. And could you possibly use these portfolios to engage, create some kind of engagement or volunteer opportunity for alumni to give feedback? And again, this could be alumni around the world. You know, that um, these are electronic portfolios, that, you know, there's an opportunity to get that sort of feedback that is very, very persuasive to students. Now, I think the challenges here, though, are, you know, how do you educate alumni about what portfolios are? You know, what kind of feedback, you know, would be most appropriate? And a, a lot of that then comes down to students articulating what is the purpose of this portfolio? Who is the audience? And also, what are the questions that I have? You know, what kind of feedback do I want to get? I think with that kind of guidance, then alumni or employers or other external reviewers can put this into an appropriate context in terms of what you know because if it's one thing if you're looking for a job but it's another thing if you know you're just looking for some feedback on your personal goals and ideas one at last point about this alumni pilot is uh, we purposely did not match alumni according to and students according to uh, discipline or co even career interests the only thing they had in common was the Stanford experience and so and somehow that was enough. It was enough just to have that conversation about what was it like to be a Stanford student, you know, being in those shoes. And the opportunity for alumni to contribute in this way is actually quite unique. To interact directly with students and provide, you know, because one thing that we definitely wanted was this to be a meaningful experience, not only for the students, but as well as the alumni. And so they, of course, have many other opportunities to contribute back to the university. But this is certainly one, one opportunity and one um, context I think that was unique and that they found very engaging. 
Okay, so stakeholder administrators. Um, and you know, what, my, what kind of evidence would be persuasive and compelling you know, around administrators? So that really speaks to what are the kinds of things that administrators might care about. So this work that comes from the Connect to Learning project, you know, talked you know, about things like persistence, you know, retention, retention rates and so on, increase in GPAs, these examples of you know, sort of quantitative sort of you know, statistics and numbers you know, coming from um, you know, about students that are participating in e-portfolios or participating in these kinds of initiatives. Another approach is to think about opportunities around um, you know, the kind of research that might now be possible with some of the back-end tools for e-portfolio platforms. This work comes from um, the University of Notre Dame, you know, where they're actually starting to do some work around uh, data analytics, around sort of time spent, student, time students spend on, uh, in e-portfolios logging in compared to learning management systems, the impact on retention from the initial introductory STEM course into the next STEM course and so on. So it seems like there are, um, there are more tools available to kind of look at that kind of back-end reporting. Another, you know, another um, approach, especially with administrators, is you know, what are our peer institutions doing? And this is actually the cons uh, consortium of schools that participated in this um, US Department of Education, FIPSI funded um, Connect to Learning project. You know, what are, who are the other institutions that are involved? And so on, and I, you know, again, there's great work happening in Canada. Um, certainly, if you had any specific questions about particular disciplines, what's happening in engineering, you know, what's happening in history, and so on, um, my contact, you know, please feel free to email me. Happy to refer you to colleagues um, and give you some pointers. And lastly, you know, is this idea of, you know, again, you know, student voices. You know, sometimes, you know, obviously if you talk to any of the students, there's no one more persuasive than actually have a natural student there tell you that, you know, this is really something that's meaningful, this is really making a difference. Matthew Liu uh, was a PhD student in electrical engineering, and the kinds of, again, experience that he chose to highlight in his portfolio, you know, range from, you know, him here giving a talk, you know, at a particular conference, you know, his projects, his publications, and so on. Um, you know, he took a pedagogy course uh, to design a, a new course and so on, so that's the image in the middle sort of represents sort of his you know planning for that course he planned this retreat for his um, for his uh, department or his you know program his group I guess and everything so I think again the sort of you know there's something again student voices you know to you know you could do no wrong just putting a student up there or bringing a student with you you know kind of thing to sort of make make the case and so on because I think that's something that also can be very compelling Okay, so going to this uh, third area around capturing, you know, and really thinking about, you know, how do we document, you know, so how do we document 21st century uh, learning in a way that is more holistic, authentic, and actually useful? And again, how do we document in a way that we can capture this work and communicate and share it, you know, with these varieties of stakeholders? Now, again, as we know, when students graduate, they leave our institution with two official records, you know, the transcript as well as the diploma. But both are of limited use, you know, and value to anyone outside of the institution. You know, with something like a transcript, a student usually picks it up on their way out, you know, mainly because they need to get it to send it to somebody else, you know, such as graduate schools and so on. And we know that increasingly that employers don't even bother getting transcripts. It's just not that helpful. And this question about what do these transcripts really say about, you know, what students learn in school, you know, and how they learned is the other thing that, you know, doesn't make, you know, that isn't very clear. You know, so these transcripts, you know, are typically, um, you know, only understandable to other institutions. You know, this chronological listing of courses with these inscrutable titles, these credits, these grades, and so on. And it's only other institutions that understand them because it's sort of an inside ball game, right? You know, that, you know, I get it. But to everybody else, it's sort of, I don't get it. I don't, you know, it doesn't really, you know, it's not really very interpretable. So again, this idea of transitioning from record, one record, to multiple records, different uh, records created for different audiences and purposes. And what we're doing is actually trying to experiment with the intersection, again, between transcripts and e-portfolios. Now, this particular um, article I just want to highlight briefly is, you know, from Reed, it was written by Reed Hoffman, who one is, the co is one of the co-founders of LinkedIn. And he says, we need to apply new technologies to the primary tool of traditional certification, the diploma. 
We need to take what now exists as a dumb, static document and turn it into a richer, updatable, more connected record of a person's skills, expertise, and experience. And so we have, um, you know, my registrar, Tom Black, has really sort of taken that as kind of his, his goal. And so I'm going to share with you some of the um, experiments that we're, we're piloting and just prototyping at Stanford. So again, this intersection with, you know, in thinking about the enhanced transcript, you know, that would have sort of the course descriptions, faculty profiles, um, I mentioned the dissertations and theses and so on, honors papers and so on, on this electronic transcript, and then the idea of the e-portfolio that has some of the information that really comes from the students. So again, on one hand, the official verified information, and then the actual student experience experience part and how can those two work together. Okay. So the first thing that I want to share is part of an initiative that we're calling the scholarship record and basically this idea of flipping the transcript. So here we have Sam. You know, so Sam was a philosophy major and you know, for the courses that he took, we have these learning objectives that were defined by the faculty. You know, what students were supposed to get out of you know, these particular courses. So clustered under each of these you know, sort of learning objectives, so for example, um, solving equations or optimization problems through translation of standard formulation. First of all, I would say, you know, you know, there's work needs to be done on these learning objectives. You know, so, you know, but that's, an, that's another thing that we're partnering with our Center for Teaching and Learning. But, okay, so let's just say formal reasoning. So how did Sam achieve these, the outcome of formal reasoning? So he was a philosophy major, and you can see that largely through a combination of philosophy courses, maybe some econ courses, and so on. Now, if, we, if I now introduce you to Charlie, Charlie was, and you, if you look at his courses, they are primarily CS courses, because that was his major. You know, again, achieving that same higher level outcome, but through a different, combination, different combinations of classes. What's exciting to me, if especially if we put these two students side by side, is this idea of um, the multiple pathways towards achieving these outcomes. You know, and I guess I am talking more about programmatic or, or institutional learning outcomes. And this, I think, really begins to highlight the value of a liberal education. You know, that there are different pathways that you know, doesn't, you know, there has been some question. Does major really make a difference? You know, that at this level and everything, that you have these different views that we can say that a student that graduates from McMaster has this value has this outcome or this competency in formal reasoning or problem solving, and they have gone through multiple pathways in order to get there. And so, and this is, again, most evident when you put these two students side by side. Now, what's also interesting, again, those outcomes um, were defined by the faculty, and you know, we did set some criteria for why, you know, what would, um, how would a student, how would this course get listed as achieving those outcomes, and that, would, that was, I think, they had to get a C or better in that particular mm -hmm. course. But there are quite a few um, classes that did not have any capacities defined. I mean, most of those outcomes were defined for our general education courses. But what this begins to highlight, again, what capacities are missing? I mean, we have them for our general education outcomes, but what about things like leadership? You know, that where it's gonna draw not just from academic coursework, but also from the student life work that is happening. Or, you know, for example, the Mac Week kind of experience. You know, should there be capacities not only defined by, you know, faculty, but by the institution and perhaps even students? What if students were to identify, you know, a capacity that they develop through a variety of experience? Let's say it's something like entrepreneurship. You know, that they are doing not only, you know, maybe they took a few courses in, you know, management engineering, maybe they, you know, are involved in some sort of club or organization, maybe they were, you know, did some sort of summer internship or something along those lines, or were inv involved in some sort of community or public service outreach. Might there be an opportunity for them to also identi self identify capacities? And then, of course, this idea of this scholarship record was designed for students, you know, for students to kind of get a sense for it. What did you get out of, you know, did you know? <laughs> that you took these classes and this is actually what you were supposed to get out of it kind of thing. But you know, this idea that you know, could this a scholarship record like this, again, which is really primary for internal use, you know, doesn't have any grades or GPAs or anything on it, could it be used in, in the context of you know, advising or career planning, you know, that kind of thing. Now, the other thing that we're uh, experimenting, and this is actually um, 
new, you know, is this idea of, we haven't really gone towards, uh, you know, badges at Stanford, but we are thinking it, uh, of this as sort of the classic badge, you know, the diploma. And we have this electronic version of our, uh, of our diploma. Um, evidently, the diplomas, you know, in, uh, here in, this, you know, in North America, you know, the transcript is really the, the document that carries the uh, greatest weight, but evidently in Europe, in some countries, it's really the diploma that really counts. So this is actually a PDF of a, a diploma. It is digitally signed, but this certified electronic diploma actually has, you know, again, the digital signature that can confirm that it hasn't been tampered with and so on, um, and also has um, the seal, which has a number, which then also could be validated if you enter it into, uh, into some website. Again, coming from the registrar's office, there's great concerns about, you know, fraud and so on, and, and so this is sort of this innovation that we're experimenting with. You know, the idea that um, this kind of diploma could be included into a, a digital locker that is provided by the university, uh, something like this, could be added to something like LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn has been looking at, you know, how do you add certificates if you've taken a MOOC at Coursera or edX, how could you add those to your LinkedIn profile? Certainly something that Tom um, has had to deal with is this idea of that, you know, when someone says they studied at Stanford, well, what does that really mean? Did they actually get a degree? Did they take a continuing studies course? And having some kind of certificate like this can help. Now, we have the official diploma, but the idea of a certificate, and there are many, many more certificate programs. You know, I understand the Mac Week students, they get a certificate. Well, what if they, it was something like this, but I think what's exciting here is that, again, this is a digital document, that one could add additional pages, you know, to this document. Because as you saw with the scholarship record, it's still inputs. It's still what faculty have defined. This is what students were supposed to get out of it. But what did they actually get out of it? You know, and what might, you know, what is evidence of their learning in that area? And so again, so let's say if you take a certificate in this one in mining massive data sets, the thing that we're trying to experiment with is, you know, is that can you add additional pages that actually have the outcomes, you know, listed, you know, that, you know, that employer could look at that, you know, massive mining massive data sets. I don't really know what that means, but what is that, you know, what were the intention? What were sort of the intended skills and so on? Or in that situation, it's a collection of classes that students, you know, would choose choose from that you know there might be some additional information that would provide some context but again more importantly I think where the opportunity is here is actually not just the inputs but actually the evidence that there's nothing to say that this document could not also include as we saw with the notation in science communication couldn't include multimedia exhibits of evidence of student work writing samples you know um, you know uh, you know videos images and things like that so I think it opens up the possibility of having a record that is much more representative, comprehensive, and more authentic in demonstrating um, you know, what the value that students got out of this particular program. The last thing I want to show you about records is, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Stanford 2025 uh, in my um, lunchtime discussion, but you know, Stanford 2025 was sort of a visioning exercise that uh, members yeah. of our Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, the D School, um, sort of engaged in. But its relevance to um, you know, to this idea of documenting is really around this idea of visualization. I mean, the documents that I showed you, our traditional documents, are pretty text heavy. And, you know, what I appreciate about their prototyping is that what if you had something that was much more visual? In this case, a heat map. You know, what if you had a heat map that represented your skills and the things that you've, you know, that you've, you're, you know, that you're, um, that you're competent in are glow, you know, uh, green, you know, but the things that you're working on, you're in the moment of developing glow red, you know, kind of thing. So I think it's just an intriguing idea to consider, you know, how do we create records that perhaps are more visual? You know, I mean, if students through their portfolios are building a data set about themselves, you know, might there be interesting ways of thinking about how to filter that or mine that to kind of learn something? To gain insights that students could otherwise not have seen through just a, you know, a static text document. So, so I find this kind of work, you know, this kind of brainstorming really intriguing. The last thing I just want to talk about is again this idea of, you know, sort of creativity. You know, how do we empower you as, you know, faculty, staff, instructors to be innovative, you know, in this work? One of my areas of research right now is actually in entrepreneurship education and engineering. And you know, we're interested in what kinds of experiences uh, students are exposed to that contribute to and foster their interest in creativity and innovation as well as entrepreneurship. 
Now I turned to the D School, you know, for this work. Um, it's not a formal school. It's a program that's uh, within uh, that sort of partners with um, mechanical engineering in the School of Engineering. It has a strong emphasis on human-centered design. You know, a bias towards you know action. You know, uh, you know human values and so on. But goes through this process of you know develop really de um, developing empathy for the user and then defining the pro uh, the program uh, defining the problem ideation, uh, prototyping, as well as testing. In some ways, it's not, it's not anything new. It's, I mean, it's you know, human-centered, user-centered design. But what I appreciate, again, are you know, these values that really focus on developing empathy for the people you're de designing for. In this case, we're designing for students, so how do we understand what their experience is? You know, this idea of experimentation, rather than just sitting in meetings, one meeting after another, how do we actually experiment? How do we prototype? How do we do something that's quick and dirty and put it out there and see what happens? Happens, and then iterate on that. And then lastly, this idea of really bias, a bias towards action. Let's just do it. Let's just kind of you know, experiment with pop-up classes or you know, mini experiments and things like that. And again, you know, as we, what I think may be useful is really kind of thinking about some of how some of the tools and techniques from the D School could be helpful in your own thinking as you brainstorm and explore how learning portfolios and reflective practices can be used to support you as well as your students. So in summary, you know, as we try to figure out how to help our students make connections, you know, engage with their community and, and the network that surrounds them, to partner with them to really create a credential um, or records that have value, in truth, we are really designing uh, new experiences for them. So in, in some ways, to borrow the language of entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial mindset, you, know, you are really in the position to be innovators. And obviously the market need that you're addressing, that we're all trying to address, is really that of our students. So the thing about innovation that I've learned you know, from working on this research project is that it involves working in new territory and being OK with it. Obviously, if something made completely sense and was completely comfortable, then it's not innovative. <laughs> then it's too late. So, you know, obviously there are great challenges ahead of us. And, you know, I know some of the institutional priorities here at McMaster include student mental health, wellness, you know, online education, blended learning, experiential learning, and all those implications that those things have, you know, for how our institution must grow and change and innovate. But, you know, these are the kinds of priorities that are worthy of our attention and efforts. And I really applaud all the wonderful work that you're doing here at McMaster and really just delighted to, to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So Helen, thank you very, very, very much. I mean, that was a really, I think, uh, a really broad and insightful um, uh, journey that you took us through. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to see what Stanford has done over, over 15 years. Um, we're much earlier in our, uh, in our journey here at McMaster. But I think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of passion and enthusiasm for the learning portfolio. The, uh, the great attendance we have here today is, uh, is one indication of, of, of that. Uh, and some wonderful things going on. And I think we need uh, to, to gain from the insights that you've provided uh, uh, us today to be able to, uh, to move our journey along uh, quickly. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of things that you had in your presentation. <laughs> I, uh, I really like the emphasis uh, around developing uh, the, the culture of the, of the folio, mm -hmm. uh, about the idea of the incorporation of turning the folio into, into a storytelling device. I think that's really important. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of, uh, of ideas and, and, and questions in the audience, so I'm going to just throw it open and, and let people uh, ask some questions. So, uh, Dr. Bacon. Well, first of all, thank you. Terrific. 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 And you completely sold me on the importance and the need for learning for Okay. One thing that keeps <laughs> bugging me though, ever since yeah. I've heard about these things, is how do you bring shy, naive students into this culture? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I can easily sense a certain set of personalities really gravitating <coughs> very quickly yeah. to this. Right. But if you ask me when I was 18 years old yes. to provide photos and videos and promotion right. material right. to supplement it, I would probably drop the course. Yeah. I'd be frightened, I'd be afraid. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and run away. Mm -hmm. and I don't think, I still think there's an awful lot of our students out there who just don't want to do that. And they, to be honest, they don't even like the word reflective. It's mm -hmm. kind of yucky. <laughs> so how do we not lose those, those personalities? 
Okay, it's a great question, and you know, in my, some of my earlier work, I was working with uh, no offense, with engineering students. Who um, <laughs> I work in engineering too, so I feel like I play one on television, even though I'm not an engineer. Um, and, you know, and it was that sort of that sort of guttural reaction to the word reflection. You know, I don't get why are we doing this? You know, why is what is all this touchy feely stuff? You know, this is not you know just tell me what to do and I'll just do it kind of thing. And I think that is a worry in terms of. Um, you know, with, uh, you know, sort of, we want this, you know, if we believe that this process and the process, mainly the process of reflective practice benefits all students, how do we make sure that it's, they're all on board? Um, generally speaking, you know, re reflection, portfo portfolios are, have become kind of loaded terms. And, you know, and to be honest, you know, I don't care so much about what you call it, I care more about the practice. And so kind of framing it in a way that sort of makes sense for your particular culture, your, your department, your faculty, you know your discipline and so on I think you know I think that probably is the most important thing so engineers sometimes the word reflection but they will be receptive to idea logs or planning or something like that so um, with respect to the students that you know that are more shy you know unsure about you know this idea of um, you know, putting themselves out there in this way. I think it is around how we how we design you know these programs to really fit with sort of the learning goals of the program. I mean, you should always start with sort of your your goals, your objectives for your students, and should start there. And that the portfolio is there to support that. And so that it's not. Um, you know, it's not just sort of like a fluffy thing that, you know, oh, you know, put up your picture. It's not a scrapbook, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, that there's a, there's an intellectual purpose to it and it's their intellectual identity. You know, when er, earlier when I would try to differentiate between like, well, you know, is it just like a Facebook, you know, kind of thing? No, it's not meant, it's not your social identity. It, it's really your identity as a learner, your intellectual identity. And so it's very sort of, uh, it's very closely tied to that. So that's where I maybe would start. Yes. That was presentation Thank you. It's so all-encompassing and <clears throat> that's also the challenge I think mm -hmm. you early on differentiated the showcase portfolio yes. from the learning portfolio and then I think the distinction mm -hmm. got, got a little lost not, yes. not because you missed it but mm -hmm. because you're covering the territory to right around. right and so the, the kind of student that Rob is, is talking mm -hmm. about might have trouble um, getting themselves out there, right. it's even more complicated for many, many students yes. to get their thinking and their reflections out there. Yes. And I think um, our interest in the learning portfolio at McMaster mm -hmm. ha has been sort of long-standing, but it came to a head and crystallized by a student experience task force that was looking at mm -hmm. redefining our student experience at mm -hmm. McMaster. And, and the right. notion then was a bit of a passport and then that shifted into yes. the portfolio. Right. So, and, but the emphasis was on the learning component. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the need to, to present yourself well and have the classic kind of portfolio was yes. critical. Yes, right. But the whole focus there was on the learning competencies and reflections, mm -hmm. that ambiguity you had on your mm -hmm. slide, which is a great slide, mm -hmm. like struggles, the moments of, of transition for students. Yes. And so I'm particularly interested on how these portfolios are used in that way, mm -hmm. while not precluding the other. But then again, when you, you have to kind of know your purpose early on, or can you actually combine the two? Well, so, yeah. So the learning component, mm -hmm. and then related, mm -hmm. so I want to ask another question, mm -hmm. is the mentor. Mm -hmm. And how critical the mentor is and what's been your experience mm -hmm. with a robust mentorship program. Yes. Yeah. No. It's it's a great question. I realize you know it does need to be unpacked you know further, you know because. You know, on one hand, you know, with these students, you know, we, we think of them as millennials. They tend to overshare rather than, you know, and, and, you know, are comfortable with that. But, you know, we're asking to do it in a very particular way. I mean, you know, around these reflections about these academic, these intellectual learning experiences and so on. And how do we create sort of a safe, safe space, you know, for them to do that? And that's why I think the, you know, you know, certainly the idea of students being able to identify the permissions about who they're sharing with and to be able to identify that, I think that is sort of one way that they maintain some kind of ownership and control. You know, I think the point that you highlight in terms of the emphasis on learning, um, you know, perhaps in that context, I mean, it is reasonable to ask, you know, 
well, what is the added value of the portfolio in this? I mean, if I'm interested in this sort of, you know, helping students become comfortable in terms of reflecting in this way, you know, that's more of a pedagogical question. You know, is it reasonable, you know, how do I sort of, you know, create this sort of context or this culture where they can do that effectively and then think about where it might, you know, how, where does the portfolio come in to be able to support that? Maybe it doesn't come in initially. Maybe it's sort of more sort of this, you know, the prompts and the coaching, you know, within the course, you know, that then moves them, you know, towards this portfolio context where they are comfortable sort of sharing, let's say, with peers or the faculty and that kind of thing. You know, to your point about the mentoring, I do think that is a critical component, you know, that um, you know, especially for these, you know, for students that it's not just, I'm not just creating this in a vacuum. I'm not just sort of, it's not me just sitting in my dorm room typing deep thoughts, you know, kind of into this sort of this the thing. But because I think one thing that we did definitely notice with the, the our alumni pilot is that having someone there to kind of give that perspective you know was very helpful the idea that um, portfolios are there to facilitate conversation you know that they're not just I put it up there you know I checked you know I put it up I submitted I'm done kind of thing but how can this be sort of this ongoing evolutionary you know kind of thing as I'm moving either through the through a particular through the course of the semester or the course of my major whatever it might be and you know how do you again perhaps build this personal advisory board of people that can provide those insights I hope that answers your question. It, it does. I think okay. what, what we struggle, we struggle yes. with, because the, the, I think the notion was, from the learning perspective, yes. a dialogue. Yes. Ongoing dialogue. Exactly. Dialogue, exactly. Dialogue. Exactly. Um, which I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with how compatible that goal is yes. with the more Showcase. Yes. So I would say then in that situation that it's two separate things. That you know that you have this dialogue conversation, it's about personal growth and development and so on. But it may be that at some point when you have when you do the showcase portfolio, that you have a specific audience and purpose in mind and you are selecting perhaps from this learning portfolio that you develop over the course of your time at McMaster, you know, for this showcase, again, multiple perhaps multiple showcases for different purposes. To really very keep it clearly defined, especially for the students. So they have in their mind that this is a safe space to kind of talk about how I'm growing and changing as a student. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask the extent to which, when, when students develop these portfolios to which they are, in a lot of cases, will be motivated through a course. There'll be a, a, a course which requires this, or, mm -hmm. or they're encouraged to do that within a course. Yes. And then there are multiple courses in which this happens. Mm -hmm. um, where does the integration of that happen, and how is that? that support? Is that all through the mentorship uh, activities or, or how are students encouraged to put these pieces together? Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. one of the challenges that we all that we face with our students is, is actually getting them to recognize where learning translates from what they learned in one course into another course. Right. Uh, we've right. all had the experience of going into a classroom and say, you know, you taught, we were taught this last year, how many of you remember X? And they all, right. of course, uh, <laughs> feign complete ignorance of the uh, of, of that subject. Yeah. Um, the portfolio is a tool that can actually help with that. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do the instructors actually encourage that or how does the process encourage students to integrate that learning? Yes. I think, you know, where the programs where I've seen that be successful, and again, this notation and science communication program, I think where it's successful and when it's intentional. You know, it was intentionally designed, you know, with the portfolio as kind of a backbone for that program. So students are taking multiple classes, um, science classes, as well as, you know, classes in the program and writing and rhetoric and so on. But the, the portfolio is there to be that backbone to kind of, you know, to be the backbone of the program. Program, so I think it's most successful when it when it's along those uh, when it's sort of you know designed that way. I think where it can also um, the message can be reinforced is that you have multiple faculty or you know in sort of the, the learning career graphic that I showed that you know as students are moving through the university and, and visiting these various you know programs and uh, career services and so on that the message is reinforced that you know that there's oh you could put that in your portfolio or do you have a portfolio that you could share with me that we could sort of go over so that you know that it really is embedded within the culture. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Phil? My question is about evidence. Yes. Are you making any progress with ABET? Or do they buy using portfolios to reach some of those uh, outcomes that you, you described there? Because mm -hmm. there are similar ones in Canada. Yeah. Um, and trying to get to that point where you know, what you know rather than sitting in a classroom and mm -hmm. having a heck of a time convincing people. Yes. For example, a portfolio might be a good way to uh, represent. 
Yeah, I think I don't know what you know what the the latest is in terms of ABET. You know what they're working on now. I mean, you know they did the you know those outcomes. You know that are more you know professional interpersonal skills and so on, um, and you know are evaluating evaluating those. I know there was some early work that came out of Rose Holman Institute of Technology uh, that you know when um, with uh, Dr. Gloria Rogers, who then was part of ABET, you know around the the portfolio work. So I see some of the portfolio work in specific in particular programs, but I'm not sure how that's being connected to accreditation. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very pro learning portfolios, and, uh, and I use it uh, as a tool in a lot of the classes that I teach. But one of the things that um, troubles me about it, in fact, I think mm -hmm. it's what troubles me the most about it, okay. is that it can be very limiting when it comes to collaborative learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I've asked students to put together learning portfolio presentations mm -hmm. to be shared and to be evaluated, mm -hmm. um, it's it's not. I, I mean, okay, so there should maybe I should be using other tools, mm -hmm. but it's not as conducive to that. And I know this is part of the nature of what mm -hmm. university or college is about. This is about the individual's personal mm -hmm. achievements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think it would be helpful if it was easier to collaborate on certain projects within the learning portfolio, mm -hmm. rather than just sort of, you know, including, well, you know, I did this with a bunch of people. Right. Right, right. Yeah, so some of that, um, you know, I agree. And actually, you know, definitely, Let's talk afterwards because I have some examples of you know collaborative group projects coming out of SUNY Stony Brook around um, you know in uh, biomechanical biomedical engineering and so on about how they've been able to do that you know successfully. Um, I would say that in terms of the you know some of that may be feature related in terms of some of the platforms are now are allowing sort of group ownership of a particular portfolio, but you know in terms of rather than being just one person kind of getting all the stuff and putting it all on together or you know putting it all on the website or you know how do you really kind of structure it so that it is sort of it is truly collaborative and you know what i've seen with the stony brook examples is that a template that is created that would allow you know that includes reflections from all of the group members you know that really where each group member has a has a way to sort of contribute so i think there are maybe advances in sort of how the technology is evolving to to kind of address that uh, that really important point I think that's something we're increasingly seeing too, an uh, interest in sort of group or team portfolios, not just an individual tra trajectory through, because you don't see the same thing if it's just, you know, because Ian and I saw two students talk about the same Mac Week experience, and wouldn't it be great if they could somehow all, you know, contribute to one to talk about, let's say, this is what we got out of it as a team. And it was obviously that they were very tight and really close. They talked about living together, cooking together, all this sort of thing. But if they could do, let's say, a team one that perhaps, or even a class one for the entire program, where they could talk about what would, what advice would they give future, you know, students, you know, who are going to do the Mac Week. So I think that's a really great point. And it's an important technological Feature that mo that you know that is needed. John, um, I was struck by the, the value that you talked about in terms of taking learning portfolio from individual courses to programs mm -hmm. and university life to include non-university life activities. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that as you do that, it goes from being a big document to a big messy document mm -hmm. to an unmanageable. Uh, <laughs> Right. Sure. Different attributes of information for who can look at right. it right. and all of that. So where is the technology in terms of helping the student to take that rich mm -hmm. uh, but messy? Because it's gonna all be collected in real time, right? It's not yeah. as if it was collected I like, here's my here's my plan at year one mm -hmm. and then I just put things into the scaffolding, right? Yeah. PBS, like, so so either the student spends enormous amounts of time going into this and mining out bits that it wants right. that they need for a particular exercise. Right. Or do we get technologies that help them through tags or other things? Mm -hmm. so, okay, here's the leadership parts mm -hmm. that are public. Mm -hmm. right? Well, I think, again, whether that's done in a portfolio platform or it's, 
you know, I mean, I think you mentioned tagging. You know, tagging seems to be an effective way to kind of at least to be able to kind of search and sort in a in a different way. You know, but it's true. You know, in terms of if we're if we're talking, you know, here, you know, we're in the early stages of a pilot, so we just have one year, so it's not like there's a whole lot of stuff. But what if you had an entire lifetime? Um, you know, what might that look like? And so some work I would point to is um, the My Life Bits project that came out of Microsoft, where you know, basically, um, you know, one of their researchers. Tried to you know kind of wore a camera right here you know tried to dock you know scanned in archived you know all this stuff and everything and tried to kind of create this database you know about himself you know and um, and you know how do you what do you do with the sort of you know all of that masses of data so I think there are advances in sort of the technology whether let's say you're building this collection of evidence or artifacts let's say in a Dropbox or a box account you know tagged appropriately and then you're again you you have to be able to filter it or select through select things that you know as you're creating let's say these multiple showcase portfolios for different purposes you know one grad student I'm working with now he's like in, in the process of trying to put together this professional portfolio is realizing that yeah I just don't have a whole lot of multimedia stuff and you know I had two other grad students that say oh you know we we teach students but there's no pictures of us teaching students so they kind of took Couple different outfits went into a classroom and had friends. Like, <laughs> one would be the student, one would be the teacher. It took pictures so that they could have something for their portfolio. Because the portfolio does call for sort of that that visual. It's showing, not telling. It's not just saying, you know, here's my teaching philosophy, but you no, know, here's a video of me actually, you know, teaching a, a section or something like that. But you're you're right. That's a that's a bigger problem problem that we need to address. And I think there, I think the technology is coming if it's not already here that I just happen to know about. I think in view of the time, I'm going to take one last question from the TO. Yes. When we're scaffolding, one of your most powerful slides for me was when you showed the full four years mm -hmm. from junior rate through to yeah. finishing off. And right. In the business school where we are, we're attempting to do the scaffolding from working backwards and yeah. finishing this way, how are we starting to build it? Right. Right. Yes. I have no doubt in my mind as I look at students and chat with them. The technology piece, they will figure out. Mm -hmm. They will do that with, with their eyes closed. Yes. My concern is the coaching. Mm -hmm. So, number one, who's teaching them and how are we teaching self reflection? Mm -hmm. The students that I work with right now, they'll put the pieces together, but it's the coaching that says, yes. what does this mean and how does this integrate? Right. Um, so, is it up to, up to faculty to be doing the coaching? Mm -hmm. Is it this notion of an advisory board mm -hmm. pulling on alumni? Mm -hmm. External coaching. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, I think you've I, I think you've touched on it. I mean I think again to the extent that so we have this goal. I mean you have these goals for your students in terms of what you want them to achieve, you know, upon graduation and so on. So the question is then how do how do they get there and how do we support them along the way? I mean certainly, you know, you know, from the things that are within under your purview are the faculty, working with the faculty to understand like how do we sort of model this for them, where are those opportunities for us to give feedback that could be meaningful that would coach them along. But you know, on the other hand, also putting some responsibility on the part of the students. Okay, this is when you graduate with your McMaster degree, this is what we want you to be able to do, you know, to be able to kind of make these connections, you know, to integrate, to synthesize, to apply what you've learned in the classroom into your in your next position or in graduate school, whatever it might be. So, you know, what do you need? You know, I mean you know yourself the best. You know, what who do you need to surround yourself with in terms of a network, you know, an advisory board to help support you in those efforts and to, you know, to have it not be constrained to you know, just this is school, you know, this is academic and so on, but that they can draw upon the resources that they have available to them too, you know, because I think that's what they're going to need going forward to be successful. Um, you know, uh, we had someone from LinkedIn who's their higher education evangelist talk, and he really talked about how do you build your network before you actually need it, you know, and to really kind of leverage sort of, you know, the resources that are available on LinkedIn to kind of be able to see, you know, what are different career paths and things like that. I mean, that should be an ongoing th thing, and given their individual goals, you know, how can they work towards that and what supports do they need and how can we as an institution provide some infrastructure to help them think about those things? I'm with you. It's the, it's the faculty member that's mm -hmm. the key player right to be able to say what you just said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. They're the first, they're mm -hmm. first in line yes. with our students. To be yes. Able to coach. So the question is can faculty coach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that 
yes, I mean, in terms of designing sort of the, the culture or the experience that would allow for coaching, and certainly faculty are very, very influential in this. But, you know, the question is like, you know, can you help, can you also outsource some of that? You know, that it doesn't all have to be the faculty, that you can, you know, that there are other resources to draw upon, and that's why I point to, to alumni to be able to, of course, it takes some work to, Educate alumni into you know what what it means to coach a student and so on. But could there are there other resources available to because it should not be just on the faculty alone. Yeah. So to bring uh, this session to a close and to thank Helen formally, I'm going to invite uh, our uh, ABP students who are learning our shot Ahmad to come up here and, and say a few words. And, and as we've been going through the quick Q and A, I've been reflecting on the fact that this that Helen is the second speaker in a row that Meadle has brought to the university who's a non-engineer who was uh, <laughs> helping engineers to learn how to teach better. And I've been reflecting on whether or not the uh, AVP Students Learning is trying to send the provost a message or not. Uh, I'll start over to you. Thank you, David. No, that has not been the intention at all. Um, I want to begin by, uh, by saying thank you very much. This was really a superb presentation. And boy, I, I sure learned a lot. Um, and it kind of takes me back uh, when I came here. So this, this is the second uh, annual learning portfolio showcase. And you know, I was thinking about uh, what has been one of the core messages since I've been here that relates to this. Um, and I'd say, I've been saying this inside the university as, as much as outside, that um, a lot of what we are, what what we could do, perhaps, is to think about teaching and learning in some of the same ways we think about research. Um, and what I mean here, just to be a little more specific about this, is, for example, in, in research, we, you know, we build teams. We do we do build teams very well, and we surround our investigators with uh, with postdocs, with. Uh, graduate students, we even get staff involved when the question is important enough. We mix them up uh, in, in multidisciplinary teams and, and off we go. And so I think that's the same thing we need to do with important questions on teaching and learning. Um, you know, that's essential. And so it, if we do scholarship in teaching and learning, then we need to find the resources um, to put our best people on task. And, and I think that's been happening since I'm here. I mean, we've seen that happen with both, both our president and our provost. They've helped Meadle to uh, deploy resources. We've had a lot of support from our deans, from, from our chairs, and uh, individual faculty, and, and students in particular. So I want to talk about one specific example of this particular putting resources and the best people together, and what I think the promise is uh, with respect to learning portfolios. I'm going to use some words from your presentation uh, in one of your last slides, you said, uh, uh, I think you were talking about creativity, and you said human-centered and um, uh, people who can uh, have the ability to do rapid prototyping. I love radical collaboration and, and a bias towards action. So one of the things that um, both Laura Harrington, who've been, who's been really spearheading this whole effort, and uh, Catherine Swanson now from our uh, uh, staff, Who's, who's leading the Learning Portfolio um, Fellowship Program that President Dean referred to earlier on. Uh, I wonder if how many of our fellows are here in the room today, Learning Portfolio Fellows. Can you just stand up for one moment, please, so we know who you are? So here are the radical collaborators <laughs> uh, who have a bias towards action. I want to just give you a round of applause for <clears throat> For taking on that task, I mean, so first of all, there are seven of them, and seven is a very lucky number, as you know. Um, across cultures, actually, I looked up why seven is so important, and I started thinking about just the number seven. Um, we have seven NHL teams, Canadian NHL teams. You know, hockey is important to Canadians. Um, so right now, we're accepting proposals from another cohort for next year. Submissions uh, are due by May 15th, and the fellowships actually begin on June 1st. So what happens to these fellows? They receive some financial support. So those are the, some resources that we are, are very intentional about. 
And, and then they contribute to the scholarship around uh, building um, the impact of learning portfolios. And, and they're advocates, obviously. And, and then they're part of a learning advisory, um, portfolio advisory group. So for, for the folks that are here, if you're interested in following this path, then the way we'd like you to go about this is to you know, speak to your chair or to an associate dean or, or, or somebody uh, in your department of faculty and, and then uh, do contact us and we're really eager to work with you. Of course, fellows are not the only ones who are working on learning portfolios and we saw all the student demos earlier on. Um, you know, it's getting stronger as we, as we move forward. Um, and bringing people together uh, like we have today to celebrate and advocate to explore portfolios is really a key part of the process that is an unlocking, I think, how the formal curriculum lives side by side with the informal curriculum. And, and this is the space for, as mentioned, personal development. But we're just beginning, and that has been mentioned again and again. Sometime soon, I think maybe one year, two years, three years from now, we will achieve some sort of a critical mass uh, at that point, the evidence and the experience of you folks, the pioneers, will be so undeniable that the impact of the learning portfolios will enable this folio approach to become really very common and ubiquitous. Something like uh, Tim Horton's coffee that we sort of see out here. And when that happens, and, and I know it's going to happen, all of you here today, from Dr. Dean to Dr. Chen, from our early adopting faculty to the students who work um, to the work we showcased today, will have established an important legacy in McMaster's long history of innovation and excellence. So I wanted to thank every one of you in advance. Um, I thank you now for your participation and contributions today. It's been really a privilege to be part of the second annual McMaster Learning Portfolio Showcase, and we look forward to hosting uh, another one next year. So thanks very much.